We're now going to uh, move to our uh, keynote speaker for the morning. I'd like to welcome Ms. Allison Muddit, the CEO of PLOS, the Public Library of Science. Um, I think many of you know that, but I wanted to, to make sure that I knew um, exactly what that stood for. Allison leads uh, PLOS to ensure continuous innovation, bold leadership, and mission-driven differentiation in scientific communication. Um, so I'm excited to hear, hear more about that. Uh, she's really an expert. She's had 30 years of a career in publishing, publishing. She's served as director of the University of California Press and executive vice president of Sage Publications. Uh, Allison also serves on the board of directors of the Center for Open Science and the Society for Scholarly Publishing and is on the advisory board for the Authors Alliance. So I think wearing all of these hats uh, will really hear a, a, a good scope of um, how the publishing industry can help with open science and, and um, maybe some innovative ideas about how this is moving forward. But Allison, uh, I will turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Great. Okay. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. And thanks also to, to the United Nations, to UNESCO for again um, hosting this conference. I'm also grateful to Professor Sachs for his comments and really inspirational um, framework of sort of what, what's happening there. I have to admit that when I was invited to do this, I, I hadn't sort of put the dates together and realized that I was actually going to be speaking on the day celebrating half the population in, in science. Um, so, so, that, so that's an extra bonus for me. And I, you know, I work at an organization that is full of incredibly smart and talented women scientists. So it's a real honor for me to, to be speaking on this, on this particular day. Now, many of the issues that I'm going to cover this morning have actually come up in our discussions over the last couple of days. And I think one aspect of this that we've all aligned on very clearly is that sharing the story of the research that's conducted is absolutely fundamental. Keith Yamamoto, who many of you will know, um, he's vice chancellor for science policy at UCSF and um, a real advocate um, for open science. He's also a PLOS board member. I often hear him saying, there's just no point in doing science if you don't communicate it. And so my aim this morning is to try and weave together some of the thoughts that we've been discussing the last few days um, to share a view of where scientific publishing is and what some of the blockers are to change, um, but also to talk about how we can carve out a more radical pathway to a system that better serves us all. For the past three years, many scientists have found them going to school, found themselves going to school in this sort of giant lab, whether they realized it or not. The pandemic put research in the spotlight like never before. We saw thousands of experts from around the world coming together to focus on this sort of single urgent problem, that of COVID-19. But it's also, as we've discussed the last few days, forced some really key break breakthroughs for open sciences everybody came together with a sort of sense of urgency to, to solve the problems. We saw information that had been previously locked behind paywalls, even though a lot of it was publicly funded, made globally open for, for scientists and for others, public health professionals and more. We saw re results shared immediately as the imperatives of this dysfunctional reward system that we've been talking about was set aside. Preprints and online sharing became the norm at a time when delays of even a few weeks to publication could cost lives. Hundreds of clinical trials brought together scientists and labs around the world. And the usual secrecy that we see too often with scientists of hoarding data for future publications for grants was set aside in the urgency of the moment. Now this all happened because it was a matter of survival. But the fundamental flaws of both the research process and research sharing were really laid bare by the pandemic at the same time. And they perfectly illustrate the imperatives of open science at global scale. I think the fact that so many of us are here today under the auspices of UNESCO and the United Nations really demonstrates the progress that we've made. But my fear is that none of this is yet locked in and that what became possible during the pandemic could still be the exception and not the rule. Many publishers agreed that access to COVID-related research was critical to accelerate our response to the urgency of the pandemic. 
which for me, and I'm sure for many of you, raises the question, why isn't that the case for every other problem that we're facing, for the climate crisis, to find a cure for cancer? Over the past decade, we have made tremendous progress with open access itself. It's not been without its challenges, and I'm going to talk about some of those a, a little bit later. But our vision that the entire body of scholarship should be freely accessible to everyone free of charge feels as if it's within sight. But open science is about more than just reading an article. It's about providing the right context to understand it, the resources to replicate it, and the tools to collaborate and make science better. And it's about equitable participation, not just in sharing knowledge, but in the creation of knowledge. Simply put, it's the best way we have to solve our global crisis. Take something like the hunt for a coronavirus vaccine. What if we all had access to all elements of both past and current research? If we had enough detail about the experiments to replicate them, if we had access to all of the underlying data to be able to reuse it, and if we knew as much about the experiments that failed as the ones that worked, I'm sure we'd all agree that it would be a lot quicker to, to find a route to the vaccine. But to get to that future picture requires some radical change, not least of which in the way in which we communicate and share research. Accessible publication of the results, data, and ideas underlying science is just a fundamental part of how research works and how it moves forward. But unfortunately, it's still very different to the way in which the system works today. Without that radical change, we focus a real set of challenges not least of which is a continued um, undermining and erosion of trust in science and research. And we've seen this really clearly over the last few years during the pandemic, and how important that trust in science is if we're to collectively tackle our problems. How can we expect people to roll up their sleeves for a vaccine if they don't have trust in the science or the scientists who developed it? And while, while science did take a hit, or trust in science did take a hit during the pandemic, I'm concerned at how that trend is being fueled globally by this rise in populist movements. It's a shift that's making it far harder for us to find agreement about both the causes and solutions to the challenges we face. Lack of public understanding, particularly among those who have less knowledge of science, has definitely been a factor here. But I fully believe that the answer isn't to put science back into its back black box. So what is the solution here? As we've heard the last few days, there aren't easy solutions, and it's going to take all of us working together. There are plenty of people who've benefited from the current system, and most of them think that it's just fine and that it doesn't need to change. And unfortunately, many of those who want to change it, especially early career researchers, just lack the power and influence to be able to do so. But when it comes to scientific publishing, concerns about the way in which increasing commercial interests have been distorting the values of science have been growing for decades. One key organization who's been sounding the alarm here is the International Science Council. And as one of the speakers alluded to yesterday, they released a really important resort, report about a year ago. Um, and in this report, they set out seven core principles which affirm the record of science. Um, those include that all relevant data must be openly accessible, freely reusable, and curated for the long term. That efficient peer review needs to be maintained. That diverse geographical and disciplinary needs should be supported. And that publication systems must be adaptable to the challenges that we face in the future. Sadly, the report concludes that the current system fails on all seven counts. So why, in the digital age, has science publishing not changed sufficiently. The truth is that there are commercial drivers at work. And the truth is that for many publishers, radical change is a threat to a very profitable business model that they want to protect. At the APE conference in Berlin last month, Uli de Nagel, who's the founding director at the Quest Center for Responsible Research in Berlin, put it this way. He noted that in the current system, the majority of scholarly publishers operate as an industry mining the currency of the ac academic reputation economy. And as such, that they are a lifeline for those who want to keep the status quo. Now, that's a pretty harsh criticism, and I'll be the first to point that all publishers are not created equal. Um, 
but I think it's true of too many in our industry. At the same time, it's also true that publishers operate in a very conservative system, that change is slow and it's blocked by the reward system that we've been talking about the last couple of days. Established researchers have been practicing closed science for years, even decades, and changing those habits requires some real upfront time and investment. There are ways in which I think technology is helping to speed that process, but the behavioral change aspect is, is really hard. Scientists, like all of us, tend to repeat behaviors that are rewarded. And given the profusion of demands that are out there for assessment, for promotion, for grants and so on, it's all too easy for them to fall back on narrow and biased metrics like general impact factor. Those metrics are often misused, and I think many of us are aware of the extensive research that shows that how that misuse has really distorted scientific practices. But journal editors themselves also tend to favor papers that tell a tidy story, that have neat and clear results. And it's led researchers to craft papers that are free from blemish, and too often that admit studies that don't tie neatly to their theories. Sorry, I'm just trying to avoid, so there we go. <laughs> and then there's a particular set of challenges for, for researchers in the global south who are pressured into norms set by the global north. And just before I go any further, I just wanted to make a quick note about sort of the terminology I'm, I'm using here. Words matter. And so the way in which we choose to describe different groups of countries really matters too. Too often, the way in which we do that carries echoes of colonialism, and it implies hierarchies, even though we often don't state them explicitly. And I've, I've read around on this quite extensively. There was a great paper that was published recently in the uh, BMJ um, by the edit one of the editors of uh, PLOS Global Public Health, Madhu Pai. And it's clear that there's no easy or right answer. And I know we've all been using Global North, Global South over the last couple of days. And I, I feel pretty comfortable with Global North because the systems that we're talking about were very much developed in Europe and North America. I think Global South is a more problematic term, not least of which because not all of these countries are actually in the Global South. And when we talk about the challenges they face, whether it's resource or otherwise, the way in which that plays out it looks very different across each of those individual regions and countries. So I just wanted to call that out. I'm using those terms, but I think we should all be aware of, of that challenge. And so to go back to you know, a quick illustration of some of just some of the challenges that are faced, some of which we heard about yesterday, but I'd, I'd like to illustrate this with a story I read about recently about a crop scientist in Africa. She's, she's a leader in her field. And much of her recent research has examined the role that indigenous vegetables could play in addressing problems like malnutrition and food insecurity in Africa. But when she submitted those papers to reputable international journals in her field, they were rejected. And it had nothing to do with the quality of the science. It was because the crops were regarded as weeds by the reviewers and editors that the papers went to in the global north. And so I think that's just one great example of the ways in which African science is excluded from established scientific publishing. People in developed economies are making decisions about what good science is and what matters without any real understanding of the local circumstances. So the challenges associated with trying to change these systems, I think, can feel pretty overwhelming. They start with this broken incentive system that rewards novelty and prestige. As a result of that, many of the research outputs simply aren't available, and that's often because there's just no incentive to share them. But that, in turn, fuels real challenges with reproduction. We haven't talked about that too much over the last couple of days, but you know, one good example of that were the disquieting results we heard from the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology. That was a joint project between the Center for Open Science and the Science Exchange. Um, it's been one of the most robust reproducibility projects to date, and the results were released just over a year ago. Fewer than half the experiments they looked at stood up to scrutiny. Now, there were lots of different reasons for that. It wasn't all about deliberate fraud by, by any means. But I think it's just a good example of the concerns we should have about reproducibility and how it impacts the record of science. 
And then finally, even well into the digital age, publication just remains slow and final, even though research itself is subject to change. Collectively, we end up with this sort of really entrenched stasis that just makes it really difficult to move forward and, and to change. Addressing these problems, I believe, is one that requires actions from publishers, not only from institutions and funders and policymakers. I think that publishers have a real role here. And I don't want to underestimate the systemic issues that are at play here, but I think there are meaningful ways in which we can begin to make progress. And PLOS itself um, is an organization that is already trying to build a publishing system that better supports um, the research system that, that we're here to serve. Open science has always taken people who are going to be willing to disrupt the system if we're to make progress. And you know, that's, that's the reason I joined PLOS over five years ago. We're an organization that was founded by practicing scientists who were really committed to transforming science communication. And so we believe that it's necessary to really more fundamentally rethink the ways in which we share research based on two key principles. The first of those is that we have to keep pushing beyond the constraints of the print format and to think about how we can really take full advantage of digital technologies and the way in which we share research. Beyond technology, we also have to lean into a new system that upholds the values of collaboration, inclusion, and transparency. Over our first 20 years, since, since our first journal launch, PLOS, PLOS has, uh, I hope, contributed to this in, in many different ways. The first is our contribution to just proving the validity and the viability of open access. And despite the fact that there are you know, ongoing disagreements about how we get there, we've made really significant progress towards that, as I noted just now. We also changed the publishing landscape with the first mega journal, PLOS One. Those journals now feature at many publishers and collectively they cover virtually all fields of, of research. In peer review, we've helped shift the conversation towards the importance of rigor and transparency, and more and more people are now appreciating those notions and that they have to be foregrounded, uh, not simply a focus on impact. And we've gone on to try to continue to develop you know, many different services and solutions for open science that are attempting to look at rigor and transparency across the entire research life cycle. More recently, uh, we've gone on to expand our portfolio, and we launched five new titles um, two years ago that are really focused on, on the SDGs. Um, the intention here is to create new and diverse communities of open science practice. And in the end, it's going to be up to those communities to help us understand how we best address the most pressing health and environmental and other, other problems that, that we face. I have a lot of optimism about what's going on at the moment as well, not just because of what we've been talking about in this room over the last few days, but because of some of the new organizations or more radical startups that, that are around at the moment. There's a particular one that I've had my eye on that a number of you will know, Arcadia Science. They're a new research organization um, that's really building open science principles into their foundations, and that includes a complete reimagining of the way in which they're going to share research. No work that's produced by Arcadia scientists or funded by Arcadia will be published in journals. Instead, they're building a new system, uh, one that's going to share more research in more different ways and look for as much feedback on it as, as possible. And I think there's a real opportunity for Arcadia. They're, they're untethered from the academic system, and so I think it gives them a real opportunity to show what's possible. It's something that I'm looking forward to, to learning from over, over the next few years as well. But PLOS, like Arcadia, has, has never been driven by this sort of, um, by tradition. We've always wanted to question the current system and to think about ways in which we can better serve driving new solutions and improving the system. One way in which we've done that has been by embracing different progressive changes to the way in which we share science, always maintaining those core principles of inclusion, collaboration, and transparency. Now, some of this has been about technology, and I'm sadly, a lot of academic publishing is still rooted in a print format. We digitized print formats without trying to imagine what we could do better. 
And so put simply, a lot of the time now, the output of academic publishing is still print first, even when there's, there's no print um, output itself. And so capturing the potential of digital technologies and the way in which we share science was something that was really fundamental to the vision of our founders. But fast forward 20 years to the era of big data, there are so many ways in which science can now address more complex problems in totally different ways. But for us to be able to do that requires access to and publication of all underlying data as the norm. Of course, there are cases when that's not possible, um, but for the most part. PLOS was the first publisher to introduce a data sharing requirement nine years ago at this point, back in 2014. And I wasn't at PLOS at the time, but I remember there were plenty of detractors who uh, talked about the ways in which it couldn't possibly work and would negatively impact PLOS. Here we are nine years later, the policy has been tremendously successful. We haven't encountered any of the negative consequences uh, that people predicted at the time. And I think that we've been able to demonstrate the value of data sharing and to also give researchers another way to demonstrate their impact. And the sheer scale of being able to introduce that kind of change on a journal the size of PLOS One has helped to normalize data sharing for, for everyone. We've gone on to develop many different progressive solutions after that. PLOS has always welcomed submissions associated with preprints, but it wasn't until 2016 that that was final, um, finalized in a journal policy and we started accepting uh, direct submissions from BioArchive. We expanded that in 2018 with a two-way street. So now researchers can have manuscripts forwarded to BioArchive for deposition as part of their PLOS uh, submission process. So it just makes it easier for them. We now have similar partnerships with other preprint servers. And by simplifying that process, we've seen consistent growth in the sharing of preprints over, over time. But I think one important overarching lesson from our work to date is that all too often the challenges that we're dealing with are really not technological in nature. One really good example of that is the internal research we have that shows that scientists are actually pretty happy with the opportunities that they have to share their data in different repositories. But most of them don't. So it seems to me that the, the solution clearly isn't just to build more technology systems. The, the process of data sharing is messy, it takes time. There are still many researchers who just don't feel confident in knowing how to do it. And as we've already learned, if there aren't any rewards involved, then busy researchers simply aren't going to take the time to do it. And so what we've been doing at PLOS more over the last five years is focusing more on how we can invite behavioral change um, through our publishing processes. And our thinking at PLOS has been informed by the classic diffusion theory of innovation. It was developed by E.M. Rogers um, back in 1962. Um, and essentially what this theory um, states is that the adoption of new ideas, products, processes just doesn't happen simultaneously. Some of us are more open to adaptation than others. And so we've been using this to inform more of a portfolio approach. Uh, we have um, newer ideas and opportunities that focus on the innovators and early adopters. But we also understand that if change is really to happen, then we have to think about how to bring along the people who are more skeptical of change. And so for those groups to think about how we can offer features in our journals, which is a format they're more comfortable with, is more likely to be successful. And so um, one good example of this is uh, a recent experiment we had with code sharing on PLOS computational biology, obviously a field in which has a lot of um, code produced. So we did some research initially, and when we spoke to researchers in the field, we heard from them that when they see authors sharing code, that signals confidence and integrity on behalf of those authors, and that in turn helps to build trust across the, um, the field, the community as a whole. We also heard from researchers that they're ready and willing to open doors for their fellow researchers by sharing their scripts so that they can be adapted and built on that in turn helps the whole field advance more quickly. So our team saw an opportunity to try sort of shifting behavior here by piloting a new journal policy. And that policy requires authors to make public all code associated with the results in an article when that article is published. 
Back in 2019, before the policy was introduced, we had a co-chairing rate of 53% on the journal, which actually, when you look at sort of sharing of outputs across channels, is, is pretty good. Um, but when we look at articles that have been published since uh, the, the policy was introduced, that number's jumped to 87%. And so seeing those results was really good enough for us to decide to make this a permanent policy. And we've been able to now move on to thinking about how we improve the quality of the code that's shared and its reproducibility. And so another model that we're using at PLOS that really influences how we think about behavior change is one that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, it's a comprehensive strategy that was developed by Brian Nozick the executive director of the Center for Open Science, to help us think about how the whole process of culture change and how we can accelerate it. The model helps us think about what's necessary at each of the five, le five levels um, you, you see on the slide here. Uh, for example, the, the Center for Open Science has done an enormous amount of work at the infrastructure level through the development of their open science framework, which is a, it's a free open source application that helps support researcher workflows. And then at the top level, uh, there have been a wide variety of open access and data sharing mandates from different funders um, and different policy makers that help with that top down level change. And I've just been talking about some of the ways in which uh, the work we've been doing at PLOS helps with the level of making it easy. There are a number of other like-minded publishers who are sort of pushing on different parts of this problem. Elife recently announced that it will become a service that reviews preprints and it's going to move away from the standard reject or accept decision that typically happens after peer review. I think that you know, this not only has the potential to begin decoupling peer review from publication, but also to speed up the sharing of, of critical research. And I think equally importantly, it puts authors in charge of the journey and making their own decisions about how to share their research. And so I think we've got a lot of evidence at this point that by pushing on, even just by pushing on some of the key decision points in the system as it exists at the moment, that we can drive meaningful change and that just continuing to nudge on different elements of the system helps to build a system that's going to be built on those principles of transparency and reproducibility. And yet the discussion that we have too often focuses on framing the transition to open science in the context of the global north. And uh, those of you who were here yesterday will see that Ariana and I chose the same illustration for this. Um, but I think it is a powerful graphic representation of just how distorted the current scientific publishing system is when it comes to global inclusion. There was another recent study from the International Network for the Availability of Scientific Publications in which they sought to understand the challenges and opportunities that open access had presented to lower and middle income countries. And the good news is that stakeholders felt that they'd really benefited in many ways from years of open access policies. But unfortunately, the picture that emerged was significantly more complicated than that. There was a clear conflict between the desire to strengthen local platforms that often were able to really serve local needs much more effectively, but then they were feeling pulled by norms set by the global north and being forced to play a different game. And if you think back to the crop scientist in Africa that I was talking about just now, that's exactly the problem that she ran into. The system of scientific publishing relies on a set of commitments to selectivity, to expertise, and to credibility. But each of those commitments have nurtured behaviors that all too often are in conflict with our goal of equity. Selectivity easily becomes exclusion. Expertise can lead to confirmation bias. And credibility defaults to status. And so that's why PLOS has also been focused over recent years on supporting new models for global recognition and inclusion. As we've done a lot more over the last couple of years to deepen the work we've been doing with global research communities, we've really been focused on listening first, understanding local challenges, and seeing if there are ways in which we can support local communities and, and build um, new things together. 
Most critically, and I think this is a point that is all too often missed by some of my fellow publishers, it's impossible to, strategy, to separate our business strategies and our business models from that drive for equity. And hollow words if we focus on equity in other ways, but we don't really focus on the things that matter. And so at PLOS, we have tried to think about how we design our new journals so that they share costs more equitably and they factor in people's ability to pay, so that they, reserve, they represent different and diverse communities of open science practice, and so that they have inclusive publishing criteria and editorial policies. And just to share a couple of data points from one of the journals I mentioned earlier, PLOS Global Public Health, the journal has 617 editors from 71 countries. Over 50% of those are in the global south, so in other words, those are the people in decision-making roles about what does and doesn't appear in the journal. And looking at 2022, over half the papers were published, uh, that were published were from authors in the, in the global south. So I'd like to just talk about a, a couple of our global initiatives. The first is the work that we've been doing over recent year, over the last couple of years to develop new business models that are gonna move us away from APCs. I personally feel that's a really important move for PLOS, given that we were one of the initial developers and proponents of the APC model, along with Biomed Central back in uh, the early days of open access 20 years ago. You know, back in those days when we were launched, PLOS was primarily focused on the biomedical sciences and charging an author's a fee to publish seemed fair and reasonable. Many of those authors received significant grants, and so if charging them a nominal fee enabled anyone to be able to read and reuse the paper. At the time, it felt like a, a price worth paying. But we failed to anticipate how successful APCs would become. We failed to anticipate how the space would be exploited by commercial publishers. And we failed to anticipate how inequitable they would become. Waivers aren't going to solve the problem. We heard that really clearly from Ariana yesterday. They feel like charity and not inclusion. So we've chosen a different path, and we launched a new global equity model last year. It provides a pathway for institutions to cover unlimited publishing for their authors and to eliminate APCs, but I think what makes it different is that the fees charged are adjusted by World Bank lending tier levels. What that means is that richer countries pay more, lower and middle income countries pay much lower fees, and in some cases they pay nothing at all. Now, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I am not sure that this is necessarily the only or the best long-term solution, but what we're trying to do here is to see how we can use funds available to start moving us away from what we all know is a damaging model. The second is our policy that was recently introduced to improve the transparency of reporting of research con conducted in the global communities. It's an action that's often become known as parachute science that describes how funders from wealthy countries pilot into global communities, gather their data, and often head home without acknowledging the contributions of local communities. This was something that we wanted to change, and so we introduced a new policy that requires information about ethical, cultural, and scientific considerations, as well as local authorship. It's information that's shared with editors and reviewers to help them assess whether the paper meets our stringent criteria for research integrity. I also want to be clear that PLOS doesn't have all the solutions, and nor should we, um, and that there really is an important role for robust local solutions, and we, we heard that yesterday very clearly. Just returning to that crop scientist in Africa one last time, she actually decided to publish her findings in a local African journal that in turn improved the visibility and it meant that her research um, influenced the Kenyan government in developing new nutrition guidelines for schools. This was picked up by other African countries and in something of an irony, there are now a number of wealthier countries that are adopting her findings as well. So where do we go from here? What's required of publishers to accelerate the transition? Evolutionary change won't get us where we need to be fast enough. At the recent STM conference in Frankfurt last October, even a panel of CEOs from the biggest commercial publishers had to agree that scholarly publishing just hasn't changed that much. 
And while I'm enormously proud of what we've been able to achieve at PLOS, our role is fundamentally that of a catalyst, and there's still plenty of work ahead. And we've been spending time over the last six months really thinking about how to inform our next leap forward in conversation with researchers, senior university administrators, librarians, and funders. And while we've heard a lot of support for the work that is done by publishers, we've also heard very clear convergence on what's failing and significant frustration in lack of real disruption. One of PLOS's roles has always been to demonstrate what's possible, and so that's really where our attention is turn turning at this point. We have a vision for a much more radical reframing of the way in which research is shared, built on the principles of open science and focused on rigor, openness, and equity. It's something that we're trying to make concrete now as we develop this next phase at PLOS. It'll shift us away from the final article being the sole center of attention to one that's built on a series of research objects that are shared and assessed appropriately at different points through the research life cycle. One that'll demonstrate that the final article doesn't have to be immutable, but that conclusions may shift over time. And one in which peer review evolves away from the binary accept, reject decision into a much more nuanced and useful assessment of the research. But as I've noted throughout this talk, there are a number of other innovators alongside us in the publishing industry, but not enough. Like academia, our industry has to embrace more radical change and let go of its own distorting incentives. Those of profits, prestige, and yes, control. As with all good experiments, the one that we've all been living these last couple of years is only going to be any use to us if we learn something from it and change as a result. We've all seen what's possible. We know what's at stake. I think there's a real opportunity for us at this point to catalyze on the progress we've made, to deepen the interconnections as we're able to do through meetings like this, and to really align infrastructure and policies. As I've been clear today, I think that publishers have a real opportunity and a responsibility to act now, but we all share that responsibility. And everybody who's here and listening online is a crucial a partner in the ambitions that, that I've outlined here today. That's why I think many of us are here. We're all committed to, to building this process. And I've really learned a lot and been inspired by all of the speakers over the last couple of days. And I'm encouraged by this amazing global community that we're building, one that's clearly committed to changing the system and not just to tweaking the old one. I think this is the only way that we're going to be able to ensure that the pandemic's legacy is not just one of what science can do, but also of the way in which science should be done. So thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts here today. And <laughs> Before we move on, I just wanted to also thank and acknowledge my amazing team at PLOS. <laughs> I am most definitely standing on the shoulders of many others there in my remarks today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. That really was kind of a, a really um, incredible overview of the, the process of publishing and, um, you know, the, in the current context and some of the pressures that are being felt in the publishing industry. Um, you know, the, the incentives for continuing on a, a business as usual and, and maybe not even business as usual, but a trajectory that maybe, um, you know, I liked how you put it as uh, seeking tidy science, which is the exact opposite of what science really is. And it, it really, in, the, in an age where there are trust and disinformation issues, to try to, to paint a picture of science that doesn't match the reality it uh, doesn't help in that matter. So thank you for taking us through that and also just really inspiring to see some of the initiatives that are coming out of PLUS to try to um, embrace open science, but you know, with an understanding of what some of these barriers are and, and how to try to tackle them in innovative ways. So we have um, a number of questions from our audience online, but maybe before I go to those, I'll give the, um, those in the room an opportunity to take the floor if you have any questions that struck you right away. Um, I see a hand um, in the front back here. Go ahead. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Rena Pantaloni from Columbia University, um, Director of Copyright Advisory Services. Um, the, I wouldn't say the whole of the university, but a certain unit of the university has turned to my office to try and um, have me develop a, a program, whether it's an education program or an information program, to counteract the lack of information about open. Um, using terms that don't necessarily use the term open, but really looking at it from the author's perspective and about <laughs> choice. And so we have to drill down and try and ascertain incentive, because as you said, we need to incentivize people to pivot. And this is true regardless of uh, discipline. And what struck us immediately was, let's take the sciences and deal with them distinctly, as opposed to other disciplines at the university. But I started to hear um, from, interestingly enough, uh, faculty at the business school about their need to publish in an open environment because they see the ability to be found and read as a serious incentive. Um, we're also hearing from faculty at the medical college about um, the use of alternative metrics to um, determine how uh, uh, someone who's career-driven and junior is working their way through the ranks. To what extent has PLOS looked at these incentives? Because um, you were wonderful in describing how to incentivize, but I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't hear about alt metrics, and I didn't hear about the need to be found and read as uh, an incentive in the sciences. Yeah, thanks. It's, uh, it's a really good question. And um, there, I mean, there's a lot of work we've been doing. I didn't get a chance to cover it all today. But I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, one is, I think there are a way in which researchers are now able to sort of, even if they're not, even if these um, outputs are not necessarily included in traditional research assessment at the moment, to be able to cite the way in which other aspects of your work have been used. So give you a couple of examples. Um, we have open peer review on our journals, um, and each of those open reviews is published as a separate citable object with a DOI. So if using the credit taxonomy, um, researchers are then able to show sort of their impact in, you know, in that one aspect. Uh, looking at the way in which um, our authors have, have shared data, we have over, we can demonstrate over 30 million downloads of PLOS data sets um, with PLOS articles from Figshare. And so again, an author can go in and get that information. So there are ways in which even if those metrics are not yet traditionally used, I think if authors start actually putting them in their assessments, um, it'll help to sort of normalize some of that as well. Um, the other thing that we're looking at, I, we do use alt metrics. Um, I think they're one solution. I think they measure something different. And I think there's also a danger with alt metrics because it's another number and numbers always end up becoming reductive. And so I think a more constructive future for us to move towards is more of a basket of metrics. And one of the things that we're looking at in this sort of new framework that we have is thinking about you know, metrics that will be on the page for an article that looks at how open is that particular piece of work? Have they shared data? Have they shared code? Does it have open review? And so you'll be able to just see article by article the ways in which the author has shared their, their research. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we can take two two questions at a time, just to give uh, also more time online. So there's a, a hand over here. You can go ahead, and then a hand over on this side as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, Lisa Hinchliffe at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I um, really appreciated hearing sort of the PLOS story in a, a synthesized way because I've, of course, heard about different parts of your policies, et cetera, over the years. I was really struck, um, both in your talk as well as in a number of other presentations I've heard, about the importance of, you know, 
author choice, authors being able to share how they want. We certainly see the rights retention strategy in Plan S, these sorts of rhetoric around author control. Um, but as you point out, they often don't actually even do the things they themselves are in favor of. Um, so they believe in things, but they don't do them. And uh, I appreciated you bringing forward some theoretical frameworks for how you're working with that. Um, but it seems to me that there's an inherent tension that we're all grappling with. Um, and I'd love to hear about the PLOS process of sort of figuring this out, at least for the PLOS journals, navigating this tension between deciding what to mandate, what to nudge, and what to leave to author choice. Because it strikes me that if we only leave them choice when they make the right choice, in our opinion, that might not be as much choice as an author might expect or want to have over their work. Thank you. And, and why don't we take the question on this side as well, and then you can respond to both. Yes. OK. Um, my name is Irene Onyancha, and I'm the chief of the Knowledge Management Services of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, excellent presentation, Alison. And you tackled and uh, talked about a lot of issues that uh, the scientific community in Africa faces. You gave an example. I happen to come from Kenya, though I'm based in Ethiopia. You gave a good example of what happened to the science uh, 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 lady and her research. But I, I just wanted to know, uh, and you gave a lot of um, issues about what PLOS is doing. Um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that um, today the, uh, uh, technology is not such a challenge in terms of uh, uh, access uh, to, uh, to scientific research in Africa because I happen to have worked in uh, the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute and uh, the, there are many others like the Kenya Medical Research Institute who have put together in their repositories a lot of the great research in, town, in, in the various areas. But I think for me, the challenge here is the selectivity criteria, uh, uh, you know, because a lot of our research doesn't get to be accepted in the mainstream for various reasons. So uh, for me, uh, the kind of way you talked about radical changes in publishing. So these radical changes need to look at how then can we include this kind of research. And some of the things that I was thinking, and maybe you can tell me about how you see PLOS, is that partnership. You talked about collaboration, inclusion, as well as transparency. How then do you envisage, uh, for example, uh, uh, PLOS working with uh, different uh, research institutes in Africa to be able to bring out uh, this research, which does exist and which is there, but for purposes for the because of the selectivity criteria it's not there and so I'd like to hear then how maybe in capacity building and you talked about preprints yesterday Joy talked about preprints being there but a lot of that research is great literature it's not it's good research but it has not even reached to the level of the uh, uh, preprint it's a great literature that needs to be fashioned in such a way that it can be made accessible I just want to know what you envisage as uh, PLOS in terms of bringing out this and reducing the digital divide of content from the African content, continent. Thank you. OK, Lisa, I'll come back to, <laughs> to your question first. Um, I mean, I think this is a really great question, and I, I don't think there's a sort of perfect answer to it. Um, I think what we what we try to do as we're thinking about it at PLOS is to assess the readiness of different communities. And there are times where we have sort of gone out and taken a clear stand. Data sharing was one of them. Our data sharing policy when it was introduced was required. And one of the criti critiques um, from beyond PLOS was that, you know, authors just won't submit. Um, and in fact, what I now know coming in is that we saw less than a 1% decline in submissions when we introduced the data policy. So sometimes we don't really know, and some, there are some things that we will do because we believe it's the right thing to do, even if authors don't like it some of the time. But more often than not, at this point, we're really trying to sort of assess readiness. So 
the the experiment I described on PLOS computational biology is a good example of that. Code sharing is much more common in that community, and so it was a good opportunity to test that out. I think the question is, at what point do we then trial and roll out and mandate that policy across our portfolio and not just on computational biology? Um, another good example is the way in which we've approached um, open review we decided not to mandate open review up front. Our survey of the community just showed that too many people were not ready for that at that point. And so our open review policy has a couple of points at which authors can opt out of that, both up front and then when they've actually seen the reviews. We're about to move to a point where we do start mandating it on one or two of the journals, but we've got enough data to understand that that community is ready for us to push them to that point. Um, so it's a really delicate balance because you don't want to lose all your authors because you started doing something that they don't want to do, but you also want to sort of keep pushing them um, towards uh, these greater open behaviors. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think it's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go, thank you. <laughs> okay, and to come back to your, your question about, um, about African science and, and how to expose more of that, I think there are, there are a couple of different answers to that. One is that, um, you know, and I think we heard about some of the attempts yesterday, um, even from companies like Dimensions and including more of the literature to be indexed and searched, but also the work that's happening locally in Africa to, to create new ways to index and, and expose African research. And I, so I think those local, um, those local ex projects to, to, to move things forward makes a difference. The challenge, I think, for, for us as a, as a publisher, and especially one who's sort of based in the global north, is sort of knowing how we can best support the emergence and the development of open science in Africa. And so the activities that PLOS has been undertaking over the last year and a half have been in partnership with um, TCC. We heard Joy speaking yesterday because we really wanted somebody who understood local culture and needs rather than sort of wading in and trying to assume that we knew what everybody needed and what was right. So we've been sort of taking that very much sort of let's listen and learn and see what are the ways in which we might be able to support local communities in building open science. The other thing that I'd add is that um, PLOS journals have a, most of the PLOS journals have a different review criteria. This started with PLOS One. And so we're not trying to make subjective decisions about the novelty or the future impact of a research article. We're just saying, is it research that has been conducted properly? Is it ethical? Is it good science? And if so, then it gets published. And that was, you know, that was something we pioneered with PLOS One. But journals like plus global public health are doing the same thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why you see such a high level of research from the global south being published in those journals. It's because we're not trying to make those subjective assessments about what's important. Too often, those are based on what's important to the global north and not what's actually globally important. Thank you, Alison. Um, we'll come back to the room, but I'm going to go to some of the questions that are coming in online, and there are quite a few. So I might uh, package a few together, and then you can, can respond to those. Uh, I think one follows directly from what you were just discussing, and the question from uh, Joe Haverman is, why do Western journals need to have a global scope at all um, rather than focusing on, on building up the regional publishing, e publishing ecosystems um, as, an, as an alternative? Another question is from um, Harris Shekaris, who asks, what do you think of the notion of an intellectual division of labor in which science produces scientific knowledge and lay people consume it in a popularized form? Or uh, the al alternatively, should science be written within the grasp of the average lay person? So I think that's a communications mm -hmm. question on how uh, science should be uh, communicated and at what level. And then, um, I'll just give you one other question, and this is about uh, communications also, but also networking within the scientific community has frequently been uh, at conferences, at scientific conferences, at venues that may not be um, 
time efficient or accessible to people who can't necessarily afford to travel to the meetings. Is there something with digital uh, publications and, and technologies that could shift in new directions in terms of uh, nurturing scientific networking and, and bringing uh, people together to discuss publications? So that's a lot. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, and the then first we can. one, just give me a quick. It was the, really, do Western journals yeah, need to have yeah, a yeah. global? And I, I, you know, I think the, the answer to that is not always. I mean, as I, I hope made clear in, in my talk, I think there are times when, you know, robust local publishing platforms are the, absolutely the best solution. And we should all be thinking about ways in which we can support and, and nurture those. I do think there are times when it is helpful to share research globally, especially when we're facing some of the global problems that, that we have. I mean, again, taking a journal like Global Public Health, it is global public health, that's the field. And so understanding um, how we're handling COVID in different parts of the world and what we're learning and so on, those kind, that kind of cross-pollination for science, I think is really important to understand. So there are times when it is really helpful to share research globally and to have a global conversation um, among scientists. So I think it really depends on the research and I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a both. Um, the second was about uh, communication of science to broader audiences. I mean, yes, I think that's absolutely important. And I don't think, you know, PLOS is an organization that is focused primarily at this point on peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer communication, scientist to scientist. That's what we're good at. Um, but there is absolutely a, a real role for translating that in effective ways um, for other communities. The way in which I think about that for PLOS is that all of our content uses the right CC licenses. It's open, it's reusable, so anybody can take it and um, do what they would like with it. We have a partnership um, with a relatively small organization that takes some of the articles for our, from our journals and translates them into cartoons for high schools, which is great, and they can do it, and it doesn't cost them anything. Um, but actually translating that research in a way that's meaningful and usable for a general public um, is a real skill. I, I spent a couple of, number of years on the publishing board for the American Heart Association, and they have a you know they have a whole unit that takes the research that comes out of their journals and synthesizes it and packages it at grade eight reading reading level, which is the average here in the U.S. Um, and that's what's used for their public communication. And so I think that's really important, but it's not always what scientific publishers themselves do. However, if the content itself, as I said, isn't open and reusable, it really creates a barrier from other people being able to move on and, and do that important work. Uh, the final question was about scientific conferences networking. and yeah, networking. Um, I mean, I think that's really important and it's something that we've seen through the pandemic is actually possible. It means some of us being up at 3 a.m. or whatever it happens to be. I'm sure there are people online <laughs> who are listening right now for whom it's not um, necessarily the best time to be doing so. So I think that's really important. And we've continued to see see that. I mean, this, this conference, I think, is a good example of that, that we can make hybrid work. I hope that technology continues to improve that. The hybrid experience was not always a great one. And I think there was a point where we all got kind of fed up with it. But um, it's the only way we're going to be able to, to include people. So I think thinking about ways in which we can make that a better experience for the people who aren't in the room so it feels just as inclusive as you, if you're participating remotely as it does for those of us who are here is really important. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, if there are other questions in the room, um, raise your hand. I might take two more from the online and then Anna, I'll come back to you. And then if anyone else, uh, okay, so we have two more. So I'll, I'm gonna um, package Two more questions here, um, and then we'll come back to the room, and then we can um, hand it back over to you, Allison, for some closing remarks. Um, we had a question from Dr. Gopal Tadapali, and he's asking, um, open science, open access can improve um, by leaps and bounds in the, in the publishing sector, but how to then address um, inaccessible cross-references that include patents or um, basically make it such that open science uh, is facing another barrier, the 
idea implementation gap so that maybe the knowledge is available but um, some of the patents needed for implementation are not. And then um, uh, Jeffrey Bolton is asking, can we realistically expect the big, big publishers to relinquish the excessive profits that, uh, you know, one of, I guess this is one of those elephant in the room questions. So <laughs> we'll pass those, those over to you and then we can um, move back to the floor. Thanks. Um, so the first one about sort of inaccessibility of other elements, I think, is a, is a really good one. And then I, actually, I think both of these questions in some ways go back to some of the remarks that Professor Sachs made in his introductory comments of the ways in which not just within the publishing realm, but in other realms that science itself is being sort of com commercialized and closed off to, to reuse for everyone. So I think there are some industries who are beginning to pay some attention to this. We've had um, quite a lot of conversations with a movement that started called Open Pharma in the pharmaceutical industry. And it's in its early days, it's certainly not where it needs to be. But I think there are industries that are sort of starting to grapple with the fact that they need to be more open. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that because uh, so many companies, you know, in their own R&D are, are investing some significant money and patents are the first thing that they're looking for. So I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a good solution to, to the patent issue. Um, the next question was the profits. profits. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we can expect them to give them up. I mean, you know, these are publicly run companies and they are therefore accountable to creating returns for their shareholders, right? So um, that, that's what they have to do. Um, we all have a decision, as we do in everything, we all have a decision about where we spend our money, right? I were many years where I decided not to, I use Lyft and not Uber because I didn't like Uber's corporate culture. And so those are decisions we all make on a daily basis um, as individuals deciding where we send our research, as librarians deciding where we spend our money. And I realize that's not always quite as easy because as Lisa will remind me if I don't say it right now, they have to serve their, their, um, their academic communities as well. But we all have some degree of agency in this. And so we should exercise that agency. Excellent response. Um, Anna, you had a question, and then um, we'll take one more question, and then Allison, you can respond and, and also wrap it up with any uh, closing remarks. Great. Uh, thank you, Astra, and thank you very much, uh, Alison. M my question is related to the one around the science communication, and in particular, the role of scientific journalists. Um, they are more and more coming to us also in UNESCO, uh, saying there is this open science, there are preprints, there are some differences with regards to how science is communicated, available. There is a lot of data, much more than we use, that, that they were used to. So my question is, um, what would be the role, a future role maybe, uh, of the publishers in, in bringing in also the scientific journals who are the ones who are then talking to the public, particularly with regards to preprints and the other elements, new elements that open science is bringing to the, to the floor. But it's, a, it's another good question. I think we saw during the pandemic some of the challenges with, with preprints, not only the fact that there were, you know, at least a couple that got out with, that turned out to be, you know, wrong and created a number of problems, but also with journalists and others who didn't really understand the difference between sort of the preprint and then the final peer-reviewed article. Um, so I do think there's a, there's a role for publishers in sort of some education around that. I, I think that one of the problems, and I can certainly speak from the US perspective here, is that um, most papers don't have science journalists anymore. They have somebody whose beat does three or four other things and science is tacked on the end. Um, you know, and I think of someone like Ed Young at the New York Times and the, the Atlantic, there aren't enough journalists like that who really have sort of deep embedded understanding of, of science. So that's one thing I would sort of put a plea in for. But I do think that there actually is, as things are moving forward, I think there probably is a role for publishers. It's actually something that we're talking about at PLOS as we sort of think to that next phase, the sort of role for contextualization. As I was saying in my talk, you know, open science is also about being able to contextualize the research to make it useful for, for other groups and whether that's something that we should do ourselves or we should partner on more and how we think about 
what those different audience needs might be, education versus policymakers versus public health professionals or whoever. I, I think there's something for us to all work through there. Um, and I, I don't have a clear answer to it, but I, I, I agree with you that I think as we move forward, if we want open science to have the impact that it should have, we sort of start need to, we need to start paying a little more attention to that. Excellent, thank you. Um, one question here and then Thanos also had a comment. Yeah. Um, so my name is Patrick Paul Walsh. I'm a Vice President of Education at SDSN and Director of the SG Academy. Um, but I'm also President of a Statistical Society in Ireland. Um, and I, my question, I think it's related to the, to the lady from Columbia University. So um, w when we published our journal, um, we, we just have a charge to every government department of about 250 euros. And we use uh, a repository in Trinity College Dublin and we build an open journal system on it. Uh, we fund a, a librarian one day a week on it uh, and it's completely open, it's free to everyone to use. And uh, the analytic, we get all these analytics, we show all the authors who's using their papers, we can show their citation dividends and so on and so forth, right? So my question really, and then on the other side, I, I'm a career academic as a dean, I saw per student to the schools the amount of money you have to pay for library resources. And then the libraries are shutting down saying they can't staff because they're getting crushed, crunched. And then you see fees going up. Uh, and then academic staff, it's hard to hire them because you want to hire them in a way they bring in the money to pay for publications. You know, So people are paying for these billions of dollars in, in, in certain ways. right? But the question to you is that like, I know you charge the fees. Um, and I don't know what to think about them, but I guess the question I have, I see a mention of a Creative Commons license, and then do you give your material to libraries for free? Do you encourage them to put them into repositories? Do you have a kind of relationship with them where they show the alt analytics and what they're doing, uh, and et, et cetera? You know? So in other words, who is really cataloging and preserving and tagging your, your documents? You know what I mean? When you actually publish them. And are you encouraging because the library's hosting this comment, like, are, is there a possible partnership with the libraries that you're really supporting them, reducing their costs, empowering them with their technologies and what they do, uh, and the authors? Or, so, is that, so I think I'm following up on, it's a similar question that came from Columbia University. Yes, I mean, because our content is um, freely available and freely reusable, anybody can download it and host it anywhere. So um, one of the things that we are working on right now is making that easier for libraries who want to be able to ho hold in their repositories all of the content that's produced by their authors, by researchers at their institutions. Um, so we haven't been able to do that, but as we're sort of upgrading our technology, we're hoping that we will be able to supply feeds to those libraries so that they can automatically deposit papers that are published in PLOS journals by authors who are at their institution. So that will sort of help them with, with that side of it. Um, in terms of the, the sort of cataloging and so on, I mean, that's actually, it's interesting because that's always been, Lisa or some of the librarians in, in the room may be able to talk more, more um, with more expertise on this than I can, but it, it's been something of a challenge with open access content because it doesn't always flow through the usual library supply vendors and so on. And it's been a particular problem with open access books. I think a little less so on the journal side because we're indexed in other places like PubMed Central and so on. But um, the, the indexing issues, I think, have, have been something of a problem with OA content. Thanos, go ahead. So, right. Um, thank you very much, Alison. Um, I, I just wanted to connect back to the previous days. And um, I think um, this is probably mostly a common and hopefully to hear your thoughts on that. I think uh, libraries can take a uh, take up the larger challenge. And the larger challenge is the cognitive barrier. And I think libraries can contribute. Um, this event, this last three days, is spearheaded by a library. In a sense that um, you know, libraries could sort of like support the communication of science uh, in partnership with scientific journalists. We, as the United Nations Library, we're in a very unique position to be in the Department of Global Communications, which means we are very close to communicators and uh, we are also librarians. So what would be your thoughts of this? And I, and I see this being raised, this cognitive barrier about understanding open science. And I have to say that uh, 
within this institution, it is also something that is very important to let our member states understand what open science is and how it can be implemented. Perhaps UNESCO has helped tremendously with the understanding and the definition, but the implementation is, uh, is a huge mystery for a lot of the policy makers. And it, of course, has so many, it is so complex. And I think perhaps that libraries can take a greater, take up greater challenges than, of course, also preserving the content for future generations. Alison, why don't you respond to um, Tanos's comment? And then I've been, I've been uh, allowed to take this session over by 10 minutes. So we're, we're, but we're approaching the, the, that mark um, in just a couple of minutes. So I just wanted to thank you for, um, you know, the really insightful responses to all of the questions. And um, also curious to hear your response to Thanos's question, because um, in supporting member states here at the UN to implement the sustainable development goals, uh, there's fully a realization on the side of policymakers that science is so crucial to um, giving them the tools that they need to actually do that. And yet it can be challenging to point in the direction of, you know, this is where you go to find it, this is the type that's needed to bring all of this information together um, from multiple disciplines. And so some of these, you know, the, the library has been excellent um, in, in our work as well in, in just uh, serving as a platform to bring access to some of those. But again, if you have uh, thoughts on how to strengthen that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you, I think you raise um, a, a really a, an important and, and difficult issue there. I mean, there's the how do we how do how do we help average you know, policymakers and others sort of really understand what open science is and its contribution. I think the you know one of the things that I have some concerns about at this point and um, the world as it has developed post COVID in, in some ways is this whole issue that of science nationalism. And that there are ways in which that mitigates against, precisely against what we're trying to do with open science, right? And so as you look at sort of some of the deepening conflicts that emerge, you know, US and China is a good example right now. Um, all of those sort of mitigate against moving forward in such a way that is going to help us solve for the SDGs or, or lots of other things at, at, at this point in time. Um, and so I think that you know that's where an organization like UNESCO or the United Nations can can really help with sort of bringing people together. But I also think there's a lot that you know, a lot of the work that I've been hearing about here the last couple of days, I think is sort of really encouraging of the ways in which different groups can work together. And I think that that's one of the things that's key to the approach we're trying to take at PLOS at the moment is really thinking about what are the things that we can do uniquely that are helpful to push this forward, but understanding that a lot of what we can do is to work in partnership and in many cases to support others who can do things better than we can. Um, I think that's one of the things that, I, it's one of the things I love about this community, right? I think we all sort of understand that and we all understand that we all play different roles. And so I think that ultimately is sort of where my, my hope comes from and where I look at where we are now compared to where we were, even when I joined PLOS five years ago, that there's been a lot of progress and, um, you know, the continuing role of conferences like this and the many working groups and other things that happen in between the, the big events like this and so on, I think are, are really critical to continuing to push that progress. Thank you, Alison, for um, your presentation and for taking all these questions and for just really getting the, the day started on a, a good um, trajectory to look at the role of publishing and what can be done within publishing to support open science. So just a round of applause for you and then maybe Ariel.